Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today, as this is our third week in the Come Follow Me curriculum in the book of Psalms. So we're going to cover section or chapter 102 to the end of Psalms. A couple things we'll be focusing on today. I love the psalm that compares the Word of God to a light and to a lamp. And we're going to talk about how it helps you with your next step in your journey and in life's journey. And we're going to focus on some doctrines that are in Psalms, this third lesson, that will help move us to repentance and good works, build testimony and faith, comfort the weary, console the mourning, and inspire us to endure to the end. So welcome to our third week as we spend it in the book of Psalms. Now, sometimes if I'm doing multiple days or weeks in a book, it's nice to have a little variety if I'm doing an introduction. So this is just one of those teaching kind of tips that hope you don't mind. I'm going to give two. These are two different introductions that if you're doing like in a classroom for a third week in a row, hey, here's a different idea or two. You could ask your students or family, look through the hymnal. Get a hymn that is one of your favorites, but here's some criteria. First, it has to make reference to a psalm. And you just tell them, in the hymnal, Turn to page 410, has a list of all the psalms and hymns that contain references to those psalms. So then they can say, hey, here's my favorite hymn, here's how it relates to a psalm. And then you just tell them, okay, we're doing this final evening. Be prepared to share the psalm that you really like and one of your favorite hymns. And it may be just a fun time to sing one verse of that hymn. And there might not be time if you're in a big class, but just get a little bit of that the spirit that comes from singing hymns. Okay, it's just one introduction. Second one is, just pretend like you're a mu music pr producer and you're going to make an album. So, the second introduction to the third week in Palms, Psalms, your mission is to take on the job of a music studio producer and put together an album of 10 to 15 songs. Well, your lyrics all come from the Psalms. And for me, as I've done studying the Psalms, I've been making track, keeping track of a little bit. Hey, here's some of my favorites. Here's some of the ones that are very meaningful to me. Well, ask your family or ask the class, review some of your favorite passages of Psalms that you may have studied the last few weeks. Choose 10 that you'd include on the album. Organize the tracks or the Psalms, the passages. Organize them the way that the order makes sense to you. And then, if there's time, Here's a bonus. Draw a picture. What's your album cover going to look like? Hey, all right, that could be fun. And then if I do this in a class, I would give, hey, here's just some idea. Here are some frequently cited psalms over the last 110 years that general, general authorities have used in general conference. In other words, here are some of the ones that they like that apply to what they've been teaching about Christ and about things that will help the saints. So there's a pretty good list. You got 10 minutes to come up with your album and then have, have maybe share it in groups or, or you know, as a family, all together as a family, just as an idea, as a teaching idea. We have encouragement to use the Psalms, to use music regularly. This is not the King James Version, different translation of Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. This translation says, speak to one another with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God and the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe that's just a reminder in this lesson on Psalms. Is sometimes it's great to be able to use music. There's power in music when you teach. There's power in music when you um, testify and uh, share the gospel. You can share the gospel through music in ways that you can't if you're just chatting. Brigham Young noted that there is no music in hell, for all good music belongs to heaven. And I think good music. Now I'm going to counter that with the ever popular Farsight. Now I'm not saying this is inspired, but top, welcome to heaven. Here's your harp. Come on, harps are so heavenly, right? You get all these movies with harps. What's you? What do you got in hell? Well, there you got the little devil at the bottom. Welcome to hell. Here's your accordion. 
Sorry for those of you who play the accordion. Didn't mean it as a bad thing, okay? Now, getting back seriously, President Ezra Jeff Benson said, Music has power to create atmosphere. Atmosphere creates environment. Environment influences behavior. The behavior of Babylon or of Enoch. So as we talk more about psalms or music, maybe it's another reflection in our life that we can look on our music, what, what it's like today. Whether you're listening to 80s or 60s or top 20, every genre of music I've found has good in it. Some have more good in it than others. And I think every genre, or almost every genre, has bad in it. So there are ways to be able to tell. A few years ago, there's a great article that gave this insight. If you want to tell what music creates the right atmosphere, creates the right environment for you, that influences your behavior, here's how to make that judgment. Quote, try Mormon's method. Listen to some of your favorite songs and write down the lyrics. Then turn off the music and read through them. If they invite you to do good, they're probably okay. If they suggest you would violate the standards of the church, it might be time to clean out your music collection. And then they added, ask yourself if you've ever been embarrassed by the music. The beat may be great and even harmless, but if there's anything about the music that makes you uncomfortable listening to it with anyone else around, like your seminary teacher, yeah, I'm glad they added that in, your mom, etc., it might be time to change your tune. Songs often are compared to prayers. As Emma Smith is about to create, she's been going to be asked to create the first song, songbook, hymn book in our generation. The Lord reminds her of this. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. And it shall be answered with blessing upon their heads. And you could do the negative of that. The song of the wicked is a prayer unto... Well, you have to kind of decide on that one, right? And will be answered with, it's not going to be a blessing. It's going to end up being a difficulty, uh, a cursing. Psalms, just so you're aware, are often cited by general authorities. Now, these are Old Testament verse script chapters that are quoted by general authorities. The number one quoted in our dispensation by general authorities out of the Old Testament is Isaiah. And I think in large part just because how much it, it focuses on Jesus Christ. Second is on Genesis. The third most quoted book in the Old Testament by general authorities, this is from 1942 to the current and a few from the general discourses. Third one is Psalms. Now in the Psalms, they don't quote Psalms evenly. There are some that are much more heavily quoted. And I want to focus on some of those chapters that are quoted more heavily by general authorities in our reading this week. So that's my study plan. Here's what general authorities have quoted from the reading that we've, uh, what we've been assigned for this third week. So you'll see that they've quoted from Psalms 107 quite a bit, 119, also 127, and 139. So 107 is one that is not part of our reading this week, if I remember right to look down. But I'm just adding a couple, just showing you a couple verses. These verses were used often in the early days of the church, when the church was leaving Kirtland, when the church was struggling uh, and being persecuted heavily, when they came to Salt Lake and were under quite a bit of persecution. They would use this verse, 107, 3 and 4, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the south and the north. And you can see maybe why they're doing it. This is a fulfilling of prophecy in Psalms for us today. We are gathering, literally, we're gathering to Kirtland. We're gathering to Nauvoo. We're gathering to Salt Lake City. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Why Orson Pratt used it this way. We came forth in this desert, in the wilderness in a solitary way. Referencing Psalms 107.4. Who were they that thus wandered? People that had been gathered from, but from the east and the west, from the north and the south, redeemed from the hands of those who sought to destroy them. 
They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, and they found no city to dwell in. How different this was from the ancient Israelites when they entered into the land of Palestine. How different was that from latter-day work when the redeemed of the Lord should gather from the four quarters of the earth and they wander in the wilderness in a solitary way. They were able to find no city to dwell in. It is that wandering. We are wandering and trying to find a place to, to dwell where God would have us dwell. And so just, just kind of let you know that they often use these verses. We don't, we haven't used it in the last probably 75 years in general conference in large part because we don't gather physically to one place. We gather to Zion, which is in our stakes at this time. Now this is also one, it's a part of our reading and this is like total trivia, total trivia. Okay. There are 494 chapters before Psalms 118. There's 494 after Psalms 118. Psalms 118 is the middle chapter of the Bible. You think, you know, like a chiasmus, you know, it kind of repeats itself and folds in the most important parts right there in the middle. That is not what the Bible does. But I thought, okay, what's the most important part in the middle? If there's a middle verse, what's it going to emphasize? Well, this is just part of the trivia that's going to be kind of cool. You know this edition, 594 plus 594 equals 1188. The middle verse of the Bible has those four numbers in it. 118 verse 8. The middle verse of the Bible is Psalms 118 verse 8. I think that's kind of cool. And here's what it says. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Isn't that a beautiful thought? It's not chiastic. It's not that chiasmus. Here's the focal point. But that is a focal message of both sets of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. But for the Bible, trust in God. A little bit different different uh, translation. I like the words it changes for trust. Because also that word trust in Hebrew can mean refuge. It's better to take refuge in the Lord. I love that imagery. You can take refuge in the Lord. It's a lot better than trusting in the people around us. Re trust in the Lord, take refuge in the Lord. All right, that's your trivia of the day. Another heavily quoted psalm from general authorities in our dispensation is Psalm 119. Now, it's 119. There's a bunch of Hebrew letters, and it's kind of fun because that's one you often stop at and go, oh, why are these Hebrew letters there? Alpha. Beth, Gamel, it's the Hebrew alphabet. It's a poem, uh, Psalm 119, with eight verses for each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. One Hebrew letter and its name appears above each eight verse segment. So whoever wrote this one is incredibly gifted and starts it off with each letter of the Hebrew alphabet and eight verses for each one and you have a lot 22 um, verses so that's just kind of two you think about one of your hymns as 22 verses with eight lines in each one well that's this one psalm one of my favorite verses and it's probably one of yours verse 105 the word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path and you can probably tell a lot of my videos, I look for just pictures that capture this. And if you look at a lot of pictures out on the internet, like this one, and you can tell at the bottom, I, I keep the reference on where I got it from. The word is a lamp for my feet and the light in my path, and it's a nice lantern. So for this one, your word is a lantern for my feet and light on my path. That's a modern day lamp. This is another picture of a modern day lamp. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, or a lighthouse to my feet, and a light in my path. Going back, these are really fun when you're camping. I mean, it's 30 feet or so, it illuminates everything. You put a table, you can all play cards. You can, you know, I mean, if you're going on that little midnight run to the, to the restroom, and you see the restroom, and you know your whole path. 
boy, with this one, you see miles out into the, into the ocean. You can see ships out there far away. They can see you. It's a guiding light. And I love that imagery. But I also realize that's not the imagery that the psalmist meant. Here's a picture of a lamp in the time of the psalmist. It is a single flame. I found a site on the internet that did studies on these type of lamps. How long does it burn? If you use this oil or that oil, this type of wick, that type of wick, whoever did it spent quite a bit of time. And what they had is they also had a little category of when you do this, you want to put a soak time. You can't just put the wick in and then the oil just kind of comes up. You need to make sure it soaks. So most of the soak time, about an hour, they send a soak the wick in, the oil, before they light it. The burn time, depending on the oil, depending on the wick, 30 minutes to 210 minutes. And also very much dependent on how much oil's in there. Small one like this, great. Now you have other ones that have large reservoirs, it's gonna burn all night. And they had them back then, to burn all night. The effective illumination, at their site, around four feet. You get past four feet, you're probably not gonna be reading much unless you have really good eyes. Okay, you, you can see kind of where you're going, but there's starting to be a little bit of a shadow. It's a candlelight. I love that imagery for the Lord of God. And just give some thought questions. What does your soak time look like in the scriptures? You know, that's the Word of God. If this lamp's like the Word of God, and you're soaking in, I love that imagery, you're soaking it up. What does it look like to you? What's the time? The longer the time, the more soak time you get in, the more instant the lamp can be lit. You soak it for a minute or so, it may take a little bit of time to light it, and you're not maybe lighting the oil reserve, reserve, reserve but you're lighting the wick, and the wick burns down quicker. That's just some great imagery for me. Why is the image a lamp to the psalmist, not a torch? You get the torch, it's going to burn, and goes a lot more effective illumination, a lot more distance. But it's a lamp. And what's God trying to teach us with the image of a lamp? And maybe it is that we need to be soaking in the Word of God every day. There's a frequency and a consistency of soaking in. There's also the idea that maybe God gives us revelation, but maybe it's not the torch. Maybe it's not the, the uh, lantern. It shows us a step or two. So Ezra Tuff Benson said this about the soak time. When individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and constantly, personal revelation will flow. You want that flowing of personal revelation. There needs to be that consistency, that consistent soak time, that regular soak time. President Benson also talks about that guidance and direction that the Word of God gives us. Like when you put that lamp up and you can see that direction, to which pitfalls to avoid. That's going to be hard on my feet. That's going to be impossible. That's a better path. He said this, The scriptures are repeat with similar promises about the value of the word. Do you have members who long for direction and guidance in their lives? The psalmist tell us, Thy word is lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And Nephi promises that feasting upon the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. Are there members of your flock who are deep in sin and need to pull themselves back? Helaman's promise is for them. Yea, we see that whosoever will, will may hold, lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil. And then he's... This talk also just talks about, hey, here's what some of the things the Word of God will do for you. Let's look for him as, he, as I read it for you. Success in righteousness, the power to avoid deception and resist temptation, guidance in our daily lives, healing of the soul. These are all but a few of the promises the Lord has given to those who will come to his Word. And I pause there. I love that. Avoid de uh, deception, resist temptation, guidance, healing. 
back to the middle of the quote. However, diligent we may be in other areas, certain blessings are to be found only in the scriptures, only in the coming to the word of the Lord and holding fast to it as we make our way through the mists of darkness to the tree of life. That's what the scriptures do for us. And just a personal observation in our day. Sometimes I notice that people have struggles with things, with doctrine or history. But one of my observations is those who are consistently in the scriptures, they are much more able to resist temptation to avoid the deception that may be out that is out there. Those who are those who are clinging close to the word of God, the rod of iron, are progressing on their path towards God. Now sometimes we do like because the psalm says a lamp. Sometimes in our lives we want lamps, plural. We want lamps in a row. We want lamps all the way down our path to show us the way. My life doesn't seem to work that way. I don't get one big long line of lamps where the Lord says, here's the direction I want you to take. Here's what I want you to do. Here's how things are going to work out. Elder Boyd K. Packer said this, Somewhere in your quest for spiritual knowledge, there is that leap of faith. As the philosophers call it, it is a moment when you have gone to the edge of the light and stepped into the darkness to discover that the, the light, the way of light ahead for just a footstep or two. Well, that's my life. It's lit for a footstep or two. I go about the word dark. I'm not quite sure. I have a feeling this is where I should be going. And I take the step. Elder Packer had a challenge earlier on in his life where he struggled to take that step into darkness. He went and asked a uh, senior member of the Quorum 12. I don't see the problem. And, and the core member of Quorum 12 said, that's your problem, Elder Packer. You can't do that. And then he gave this great quote to Elder Packer. You must learn to walk to the edge of the light and then a few steps into the darkness. Then the light will appear and show you the way before you. Then he quoted these 18 words from the Book of Mormon. Dispute not because you see not, for you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. Those 18 words from Moroni have been like a beacon light to me. And to me, that's a lot what the Word of God is. It shows me my path, but not the whole path. Maybe it is a few feet ahead of me. Sometimes I get glimpses of maybe over the hill or a couple hills away. But they're glimpses and they give me hope and I keep going. Well, back to um, that verse. Because sometimes we read 105 and we skip 106. And I think they should be paired. Often general authorities, they quote it, they quote these in pair, in tandem. Because the word of the Lord is a lamp. It's a light. And it says, if you're, implies this, you're on a path. And the lamp is there, the Lord's given it to you. And there's an implication that you're walking on it, that you're walking the path of discipleship. And when God gives you light or revelation, you are to act on it. That's verse 106. I have sworn. Hey, I've promised. I will perform it. You give me light. You give me direction. I'm going to do it. And when you do that, when you listen to the Spirit and you act on it, your resolve to keep God's commandments, your resolve to keep on that covenant path, increases, is developed. That's the next part of the verse. I've promised, I've sworn, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be obedient to the light, knowledge, the inspiration you've given me, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I'm going to keep your commandments. It's helping me. I love that. Perform it, keep the righteous judgments. Now, different topic, a friend comes up to you and says, having family seems like a burden. that would prevent me from doing other important things with my life. When I get older, assuming they're not quite as old as me, I think I'd be much happier if I did not have children. How would you respond to a friend who says something like that? And what are some priorities people might put ahead of having children? Psalms 127 is frequently used on this topic. 
And this is the verse that's frequently used by general authorities. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. One of the most obvious places where this psalm and this verse is used is a family proclamation. It is found, and you can see at the first bottom of the first column, husband's wife has solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and their children. Quote, children are a heritage to, of the Lord. That's Psalm 127.3. And just of note, how many other scriptures are quoted in the family of proclamation to the world? That's the only one. It's one where is it vitally important that we know children are a heritage. They're a blessing. President Russell M. Nelson has testified. Throughout the world, the family is increasingly under attack. If families fail, many of our political, economic, and social systems will also fail. And if families fail, their glorious eternal potential cannot be realized. Our Heavenly Father wants husbands and wives to be faithful to each other and to esteem and treat their children as a heritage from the Lord. In such a family, we study the scripture and pray together, and we fix our focus on the temple. There we receive the highest blessings that God has in store for His faithful children. All right, you want your children to be treated like a heritage? A couple suggestions. Study the scriptures with them. President Nelson suggests. Pray with them. Pray together. And fix your focus on the temple. Great advice. Elder Neil A. Anderson also added, When a child is born to a husband and wife, they are fulfilling part of our Heavenly Father's plan to bring children to earth. Families are central to God's eternal plan. I testify of the great blessing of children and of the happiness they will bring us in this life and in the eternities. Now, one other psalm that's often quoted in our dispensation is Psalm 139. Church leaders have quoted it in the past in very difficult times. They've quoted some sections of Psalm 139, like in the days of Kirtland, when there was a great apostasy. In the days of their persecution, in days like when they were in Salt Lake City and the federal government was looking at legislation and had enacted resol re uh, resol re re uh, laws that would make it so church leaders could be imprisoned. Lorenzo Snow said this, I remember very well the cloudy and stormy days of Kirtland and how foolishly some people acted. There are men who occupied high standing in the church who disgraced themselves, having behaved in manner which afterwards brought a blush of shame to their cheeks. There's a reason for that. They had lived so that they could have could have offered up their hearts in David's prayer. Oh, wait, I forgot that. Had they lived so they could have offered up their hearts in David's prayer, and I'm going to quote this in just a minute, they would not have been numbered among those who apostatized and fell in the hour of trial. It would be well to examine ourselves, hold communion with ourselves in the secret closet, to ascertain how we stand before the Lord, so that if it needs be, we may renew our diligence, faithfulness, increase our good works. If they would have done this back then, ask this question that David asked. In David's prayer, they wouldn't have fallen. Here's the prayer, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting." President Lorenzo Snow doesn't blame a mob. He doesn't blame a government. He doesn't blame enemies. He says, we're having this distress right now. Search my heart. Search my thoughts. If there's any wickedness in me, help me get rid of it. Lead me back to you. Turn me back to you. That's my prayer. And Lorenzo Snow, if our, in the days of Kirtland, leaders and saints in Kirtland would have just said, if there's something wrong with my heart and my thoughts and change them, they wouldn't have apostatized. President John Taylor, in the midst of it, one of the most difficult times of his life and for the church, used these verses again. God is now feeling after us and will disclose our secret thoughts. 
it would be well to purify and prepare ourselves. And in language of the psalmist, call upon God, saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way everlasting. If we succeed in passing through the approaching fiery ordeals with our fidelity and integrity unimpeached, we may expect at the close of our trials a great and mighty outpouring of the Spirit and power of God, a great endowment upon all who shall have remained true to their covenants. I don't think the church is in this today, is in the same dire circumstances as maybe it looked like in Kirtland or in the days when John Taylor was the prophet. I think we have struggles. But I love this advice for us. Hey, let me start with me. Search me. Search my heart. Search my thoughts. If there's anything that I need to have adjusted so I can turn a little bit back more to the covenant path and be there, help me. Because in the end, I agree with what President Taylor said. If we pass through these trials with our faith, with our integrity, there will be a great outpouring of the Spirit to us, and there'll be a great endowment upon all who've been who remained faithful to their covenants. Thanks for spending some time with me in Psalms, and I would probably add, it's a good reminder that as we've you studied Psalms for three weeks, that we use hymns in our teaching and in our study. Hymns have a power to be able to move us, and I just leave with this reminder from the first presidency. It could be said about the Psalms, the Old Testament hymn book, or the Psalms of today, our hymn book. Some of the greatest sermons are preached by the singing of hymns. Hymns move us to repentance and good works, build testimony and faith, comfort the weary, console the mourning, and inspire us to, to endure to the end. We hope to see an increase of hymn singing in our congregations. We encourage all members, whether musically inclined or not, to join us in singing the hymns. We hope leaders, teachers, and members who are called upon to speak will turn off into the hymn book to find sermons presented powerfully and beautifully in verse. For me, that's been a theme for the last three weeks because I believe that the Psalms do that, have done that for me and can do that for all of us. The Psalms move us to repentance, good works, build testimony, build our faith. They comfort the weary, console the mourning, inspire us to endure to the end. So some of my teaching thoughts is, maybe as you now have come to the end of this week and you study this week, what doctrines have you learned in Psalms? What verses have moved you to repentance or good works that built your testimony, built your faith, maybe comforted you, consoled you, or inspired you? Maybe that's a part of that list you've been keeping or underlining or highlighting whatever you've been doing to keep track of them. And I just love that idea of the Word of God being a light to you. Maybe that's something in a class you'd consider spending more time on. How's the Word of God? What's, how's it like a light to you? And it's okay, I think, if somebody says, hey, it's like a spotlight. Because there's some good analogies. It is like a lantern. Great. It's like I'm on a ship being tossed in the waves, and I do see that big searchlight of the lighthouse. And I can see the promise of an eternal bliss. I think some of those things work for me. And what are you doing to preparing you with that lamp like the ten virgins who had their oil in, who've had it in with soak time. They're prepared. They're ready to light it. And it's not just going to be lighting the wick and the wick burning down quickly. They're ready for it to last hours, especially in the time when the Savior comes. And then I just add on the other teaching thought at the very beginning, just different ways to introduce the same topic, not the same topic, because there's different doctrines taught in Psalms, but hymns. Um, so introduction, relating hymns to make it an album. Or, you know, hey, you can even say, do you want to write your own psalm? We've studied them for three weeks. Let's write our own psalms. Then share and see if there's any you want to share with the, with the family or, or class that you think are pretty good. I've got people in my, my ward They'd write one, and it would be magnificent, beautiful. Me, I would scratch out a couple lines, then I'd go home and go, oh, this is what I should have wrote. Yeah, well, that's just me. Thanks for spending some time with me as we've studied, I'm calling it Psalms 3, or Psalms 102 to 150. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.